had so many tributes to so many poets uh, uh, that I think I, I want to continue in the vein of tributes to poets. And this is a poem called Preface to with Muriel for the great American poet uh, Muriel Rukhauser. And, and the title is, of course, also a tip of the hat to the Hermes Monk. Instead of a cup of tea, instead of a milk silk well for the cup, of a cup of nearly six o'clock tea time, cup of a stumbling block, cup of an afternoon unredeemed by talk, cup of a cup brown loaf, of a slice, a lack of butter, blueberry jam that's almost black. Instead of cannon seeping into the cracks of a pot, the void of an hour seeps out, infects the slit of a cut I haven't the wit to fix with a surgeon's needle threaded with fine gauge silk as a key would thread the cylinder of a lock. But no key threads the cylinder of a lock. Late afternoon light, transitory, licks the place of the absent cup with its rough tongue, flicks itself out beneath the wheel's revolving spoke. Taut thoughts gone, with a blink of attention, slack, a vision of death and distance in the mix. She lost her words, and how did she get them back when the corridor of a day was a lurching deck? Life logic encodes in nervous kicks, she translated to a syntax which connects intense and unfashionable politics with morning coffee, Hudson sunsets, sex, then the short circuit of the final stroke, the end toward which all lies look out and broke. What a gaze out the window interjects. On the southeast corner, a black lab, box, tugged as the light clicks green toward a late day walk by a plump brown girl in a purple anorak. The Bronx bound local comes rumbling up the tracks, out of the tunnel, over West Harlem blocks, whose windows gleam on the animal warmth of bricks, rouged by the fluvial light of six o'clock. for a poet who was my good friend, June Jordan, um, who died in California much too early. Um, Ten years ago now, you don't. And uh, it's in two parts, and I'll just read it. It's called, uh, it's called Elegy for a Soldier, and some of you may remember that June wrote an autobiography about uh, her childhood. Um, West Indian childhood in Brooklyn, where her father used to call her Little Soldier. The city where I knew you was swift. A lover cabbed to Brooklyn. Broke, but so what? After the night shift in a Second Avenue diner, the lover was a Quaker, a poet, an anti war activist, was blonde was 24. Wet snow fell on the access road to the Manhattan Bridge. I was neither lover, slept uptown. But the arteries, street lights, headlines, phone lines, feminine plural links ran silver through the night city as dawn and the yellow cab passed on the frost-blurred bridge, headed for that day's last first coffee. The city where I knew you was rich in 
bookshops, potlucks, ad hoc debates, demos, parades, and picnics. There were walks I liked to take. I was on good terms with true rivers. You turned, burned, flame wheel of words, lighting the page, good neighbor on your homely street and park slope, whose Russian Zaydas, Jamaican grocers, dyke vegetarians, young, gifted, everyone claimed some changes, at least a new food co-op. <laughs> In the laundromat, ordinary women taught revolution. We knew we wouldn't live forever, but it seemed as if we could. The city where I knew you was yours and mine by birthright, Harlem, the Bronx. Separately, we left it and came separately back. There's no afterlife for dialogue, divergences we never teased apart to weave back together. Death slams down in the midst of all your unfinished conversations. Who do I address when I address you, larger than life as you always were, not alive now? Words, poems are not you. Ashes on the Pacific tide, you least of all. I talk to myself to keep alive. The city where I knew you is gone. Pink icing roses spelled out passion on a book-shaped chocolate cake. The bookshop's a sushi bar now, and passion is long out of print. Would you know the changed street that cab swerved down toward you through cold white mist. We have a Republican mayor. Threats keep citizens alive. Anthrax, suicide attacks. A scar festers where towers once were. Dissent festers unexpressed. You are dead of a woman's disease. Who gets to choose what battle takes her down? Down to the ocean. Friends warn you with no time to mourn. Two. You who stood alone in the tall bay window of a Brooklyn brownstone, conjuring morning with free flying words, you the power, terror in words in flying. You the high of solitude. While the early light prowled Seventh Avenue, you pine, hungry like you, your spoils, raisins and almonds, ballpark pen, yellow fool's cap. You, who stood alone in your courage, never hesitant to underline the connection between rape, exclusion, and occupation, and separations, were alone and were not alone, when morning blotted the last spark of the out. Around you, voices you no longer had voice to answer, eyes you were blind to. All your loves were singular, discarded labels claimed black woman, for the, and for the rest eluded limits, quicksilver, Caribbean, staked out self-definition. Now your death, as if it were yours, your house, your dog, your friends, your son, your serial lovers. Death's not yours, but yours are a thousand poems alive on paper. You, at once an optimist, a Cassandra, Lilith in the wilderness of her lyric, were a black American born in Harlem citizen soldier. If you had to die, and I don't admit it, who dared? What if each time they kill a black man, we kill a cop? 
couldn't you take down with you a few prime villains in the capital who are also mortal? <laughs> Junior should be living, the states are bleeding. Leaden words like homeland translate abandoned dissident discourse. Twenty years ago, you denounced the war crimes still in progress now as Janine, Ramallah, dominate, then disappear from the headlines. Palestine, your war. To each nation, it's Jews, wrote Primo Levi. Palestinians are Jews to Israelis. Afterwards, he died in despair, or so we infer, despairing. To each nation, it's Jews, it's blacks, it's Arabs, Palestinians, immigrants, it's women. From each nation, it's poets, Mahmoud Darwish, Kavanaugh, Shadi, who, beloved witness for silenced Kashmir, cautioned, shift the accent, and he was martyr. Audrey Lord, Neruda, Amichai, Senghor, and you. And um, another another tribute to another poet. Um, uh, no, actually, I'll read this one first. Um, uh, these the, these next two poems are glosses, where you take four lines from somebody else's poem and will elaborate four stanzas each one, ending in one of those lines. And this one, for this one, I took four lines from a translation I had done myself of a poem by the French poet Claire Malraux, and the four lines of that poem are, blood's risks, its hollows, its flames, exchanged for the pull of that song. Bone-colored road, bone-colored sky, through the white days of the storm. Once out of the grip of desire, or if you prefer it, its embrace, free to do nothing more than admire the sculptural planes of a face. Are you gay, straight, or bi? Are you queer? You still tell your old chaplet of names, which were numinous once. You replace them with adjectives, witty, severe, by trilingual, abstracting blood's claims, blood's twists, its hollows. Dreams. No craving, no yearning, no doubt, no repulsion that follows release, no presence you can't do without, no absence an hour can't erase. The conviction no reason could rout of being essentially wrong is dispelled. What feels oddly like peace now feels now fills space you have blathered about when the nights were too short or too long exchange for the pull of that song. But peace requires more than one creature released from a habit of craving on a planet that's mortgaged its future to the lot who are plotting and waiting. There are rifts which no surgeon can suture overhead in the street under sea. The bleak plain from which you are waving, mapped by no wise benevolent teacher, is not a delight to the eye. Bone colored road, bone colored sky. You know that the weather has changed, yet do not know what to expect with relevant figures expunged and predictions at best incorrect. Who knows on what line you'll be ranged? And who, in what cause, you will harm? What cabal or hunter or sect has doctored the headlines, arranged for perpetual cries of alarm through the white days of the storm? Mm -hmm. And um, to this is a total shift. Uh, this is a <coughs> section from an ongoing project a collaborative pro project with the Palestinian-American poet uh, Dima Shahabi, 
uh, which is a series of renga that we have been in, in that tra in the tradition of the renga, uh, writing back and forth since 2009. Um, they, they started during the uh, invasion of Hazard by the Israeli troops at, at, at the end of 2008 and beginning of 2009. Uh, and I sent a short a renga, in fact, that I had written about a Palestinian child that I saw on the news video, and Dima sent one back, and I sent one back to her. Uh, these are just a few of mine, and I will I, I can read the lines or from from Dima's poems that were the cues to mine, and because the idea is that each of the each of us would take a cue from the last poem by by the other and use them to, to write a new one. And they go back and forth. And Maha that just means open higher. So the first one. Five, six, and righteous, the child in green at Kaza stands in her wrecked home, grubby indignant. Her hands point, she explains what was done, bombed, burned. It all smells like gas. We had to throw our clothes away, the earrings my father gave me. No martyr, resistant. The burnt cradle and the key curtains flip across. The third floor window in Belleville dyed blue purple like the hyacinth on the windowsill. Nedma does math homework. Strike today, but school tomorrow. Coming back from the demo, they sang in the street. Rêve général. The slogan makes her smile. Long winter sun. He line, where are the hills? And there were two that followed him as well. Where are the hills? He saw from New York. Mahaba Yanafisa. Girl, you watch your back. Tanks and uniforms zap guys' minds worse than testosterone. But you were gorgeous, reasoning as you dodged to keep them from aiming at the brothers behind you, dancing along the barbed wire. Still, where are the hills? That your grandfather's farm sat between, that you climbed a boy in summer near the Syrian border, maybe 20 years ago. You are still young. Our hands touch over the table, over the open books on the table, out of which you are teaching your language to an old Jew. Q line is always a word emerging mid-throat like the ayin in an emigrant winter a word that casts blue-white flame across the cafe counter. Nightfall, it's heady as the red wine they're drinking to hear each other's stories in the third language, the bridge on which they first met. The ocean sound of the trees through mine. The horse and the night and the wide desert know me, and this narrow street where fine rain falls before dawn, and the child in the next room, coughing in her sleep, window in November cracked open, the beat pen and the wind that slips in with insistent chilly tears. <coughs> Alleyway that smells of the sea. Dogs on the porch street fighting over a fish head spoiled fruit. He can smell the discarded orange peels guards through to exiled children. He was 16 then, no dog, no child, a teacher. Others learned to read from the tea-stained grammar book he grabbed up first when they fled. The halal butcher has a charity tin for enfants de Gaza. I pay for my leg of lamb and dropping all of the change. Walk away up the Rue de la Roquette humming, Guantanamera. <laughs> I'm obsessed with 
plus Voltaire of White Lady can enjoy the truth. Sitting in a garden. Sitting on damp grass, she recites Asayab's lines on Dickinson's lawn. Slowly, her anglophone friend repeats each verse after her. Back in Mosul, I'll either buy a house, I'll either build a house or buy a plot for a grave. Inshallah, you build a house. Keep that line. Uh, here is the other glosa of this uh, This one is taken, built around four lines from a poem called Willow by Anna Akhmatova, uh, translated by Judith Hemschmeier. And the, this is one of those um, dramatic monologues we were talking about where the persona is someone very like Akhmatova. And I would like to say it just that, in fact, um, but of the as most of you know, uh, during the Stalinist period when she was forbidden to publish, she would write poems and then uh, memorize them late at night in, or early in the morning with a friend, uh, many friends, at one, at one at a time. And one of them was a young widow named Lydia Chopskaya, who wrote about this um, and in, a, in a biography written, uh, a book about it, not written for decades and decades and decades and decades. And so the four lines of Akhmatha Bazaar, and I grew up in pattern tranquility in the cool nursery of the new century, and the voice of man was not dear to me, but the voice of the wind I could understand. A sibilant wind presaged a latish spring. Bare birches leaned and whispered over the gravel path. Only the river ever left. Still, someone would bring back a new sailor midi to wear in the photograph of the four of us. Sit still, stop fidgeting. Like the still, leafless trees with their facility for lyric prologue and its gossipy aftermath, I like to make up stories. I like to sing. I was encouraged to cultivate that ability. And I grew up in happy tranquility. In a single room with a greasy stain by the scar from the gas fire's fumes, when any guest might be a threat, and any threat was a guest from the past or the future. At any hour of the night, I would put the tea things out, though there were scrap leaves of tea, but no sugar or a lump or two of sugar, but no tea. Two matches, a hoarded cigarette, my day's page ashed on its beer in a bed sitter. No godmother had presaged such quaint nights to me in the cool nursery of the young century. The human voice distorted itself in speeches a rhetoric that locked locks and ticked off losses. Our words were bare as that stand of winter birches while poet tasters sugared the party bosses' edicts, the only sugar they could purchase, with servile metaphor and simile. The effects were mortal, however complex the causes when they beat their child beyond this thin wall, his screeches, wails, and pleas were the gibberish of history. And the voice of man was not dear to me. Men and women, I mean, those high-pitched voices, how I wanted them to shut up. They sound too much like me. Little machines for evading choices, little animals selling their minds for touch. The young widow's voice is just hers, as she memorizes the words we read and burn, nights when we read and burn, with the words unsaid, hers and mine, and we watch and are watched, and the river reflects what spies. Is the winter trees rustling a code to the winter land? 
but the voice of the wind, I couldn't understand. Does anyone have a water bottle with some water? I Merci, Picasso, je veux bien. Which means literally what's new about the war, but it's also a French expression, which just means what's new. And 
still good enough so I can Five old men beset last week's election. Jacques' student granddaughter bought a studio apartment bigger than the three rooms that he lived in with his two brothers' parents in the Rue du Pont au Chou, two streets up. Glasses folded on his cap, Maurice fishes for a not quite lost repast in Yiddish. His accent is a familiar garment on a neighbor here or in Strauss Park on Upper Broadway. The senior four worked here before the war. Now they're back in the rag trade. An 11 o'clock break, tradition, black coffee and discussion, the Heger revealed later. The one two decades younger, Victor, will at last bring up Israel, 60-ish son asking his elders what ought to be done. And Maurice, the, pou the pouches around his eyes crease deep in a sad smile, says, having no wars, not much peace, a schoolboy in Krakow in 1930. A solution? There is just one, the final solution. Does he mean the British had a plan in 48, Arabs should finish Hitler's job in the new state? Does he mean genocide in Palestine to be practiced by our own? Victor changes the subject. The waitress interrupts exegesis. Please pay, her shift is over. The watchdog of the cafe, a boxer, trails his young boss, stops at her trim heels. He scowls, sniffs the floor, and gets sorts on his job. shakes the summer square, breakfast shift, no, sorry, this first one is yet, yet another cafe, yet, yet another cafe business. <laughs> <laughs> a giant poplar shades the summer square, breakfast shift done, Reen smooths her kinky mass of auburn curls, walks outside, her leaf print dress, green shadow on post-millennial bright air. It's almost noon. I smell sweat. I smell, despite bamboo sun and deodorant, crumpled and aging. While recognizant of luck to be today perennial, appreciating trees. The sky is clear as this, Mikaza and Guantanamo, about which I know just enough to mourn yesterday's dead. The elegies get worn away. Attrition crumbles them into chasm or quick line of a train view. Be mindful of names. They'll etch themselves like daily specials on the window glass in a delible medium. <coughs> They'll pass, transformed, erased, a cloud the wind dissolves above the ruckus of the under twelves on the slide, the toddlers on the grass, the ragged skinny guy taking a piss in the bushes, a matron tanning her calves on a bench, skirt tucked above her knees. A sparrow lands in the japonica as if it were a signal. All at once, masked pigeons rush up from adjacent trees, wing beats intrusive and symphonic. A near total silence is the clear response. Four firelit mirrors lining the Corsican restaurant's walls reflected divergencies. Palestinian, Syrian, Lebanese, expat Russian, expat Jewish American. 
a new war had begun that afternoon. The shrinking world shrieked its emergencies well beyond our capabilities, if not to understand, to intervene. Though Mora, who practices medicine, has made an intervention a career. Khalid spent decades studying history in the jaws, shall we say, of an emergency. Start another bottle of rough-tongued wine that sank with glitter in the midnight mirror. Edinburgh Airport seems provincial when you're headed back to Chateau de Gaulle, in dusty sunlight of a mid-July midday. I had an hour. But there was Hind. We'd been at the same conference all weekend, who had three connections, Heathrow, Cairo, Beirut, where the runways had been bombed, to Damascus. With airport Starbucks, we brainstormed the thesis in progress. She'll have to write in English if she's going to publish it lesbian writers in the Arab world. Morning call. I don't know if she got home. I emailed her. I haven't heard from her. The war had started five days earlier. Nora is writing about women also, women in war. She sends an email from Mosul. The books arrived and they are beautiful. I know, of course, the work of Fadwa Tukan, but since the invasion and the occupation, it is hard to find books, even in Arabic. Attached is the synopsis of my postdoc proposal and the draft of a translation. I cannot visit my old teacher in Baghdad. Because I am Sunni and from Mosul, I would be immediately slain. Through the cracked prism of Al-Andalus, we witness mourning, but we never have. The war goes on and on and on and on. The names have been changed. Nobody's sister will be gunned down because her brother shook hands with one politician or another, or because a well-meaning woman activist kissed her father on both cheeks the way we do here, thinking we're all Mediterranean after all. Nobody's J-1 visa will be revoked because of the conference she went to at Caracas, or worse, Tehran. We have an almost fiction with mnemonic cues which could be proper names or days. Sitting another empire's bitter tonic, an inadvertent exile contemplates Harvard Square's nightlights on Ramadan. And will we one last call which is, um, I, I was actually, it's called a braid of garlic, and it is in part an elegy for the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, and it is in part for my friend, the Canadian writer, Mavis Kalad, who is alive. Uh, and I was very touched because I read this poem in a couple of languages in Morocco last weekend, and a Moroccan, I who knew Darwish was there, and she said she visited his home after he died, and there was a great garlic hanging on the wall. This is called a great garlic. Aging women mourn by the go to market, buy fish, figs, tomatoes, enough today to feed the wolf asleep underneath the table who waits for what dream. What but loss comes round with the changing season? He is dead whom, daring, I called a brother, with that leftover life perched on his shoulder, calling departure. He made one last roll of the dice he met his last best interlocutor days before he lay down for the surgery that might, might not extend the gamble. What they said belongs to them. Now a son writes elegies, though he has a living father. One loves sage tea. One gave the world the scent of his mother's coffee. 
light will shrunk back to what it was in April, incrementally will shrink back to winter. I can't call my peregrinations exile. They count the mornings. In a basket hung from the wall, its handle festooned with cloth flowers from chocolate boxes, muffled purple shamas, and look beside it a braid of blood. I remember ten days after a birthday, counterpoint and candlelight in a wine glass, how the woman radiologist's fingers probed, not caressing. So reprise what wasn't called a recurrence of a 15 years ago rite of passage. I arrived encumbered with excess baggage scarred on the threshold. Through the mild winter sun in February, two or three times weekly to Goblat, the geriatric hospital where my friend was getting her nerve back. At the end of elegant proofs and lyric, incoherent, furious trolls and diapers, fragile and ephemeral as all the beauty of human spirit. While the former journalist watched, took notes and shocked, regaled her visitors with dispatches from the war zone in which she was in bed, hiding her time there. Now in our own leftover lives, we toast our memories and continents. I have scars where breasts were, where breasts were. Her gnarled fingers these days can hardly hold the pen stand. Thousands mourn him while in the hush and hum of life support for multiple organ failure, utter solitude, pause of scarlet wings that flutter and vanish. <laughs>